and <laughs> no hi and welcome back to walk through the ages i'm callie lopez i'm Alyssa phillips and today we're going to be talking about the second part of the chapter of the plan of redemption yes we're very excited about discussing the second half which i think is the better half me too <laughs> <laughs> so i'm going to open with prayer if that's okay all right perfect father in heaven it is such a privilege to be able to look upon your plan of redemption and see your love and your beauty through the whole weave of what you are creating to bring us home. And I just ask, Lord, for the Holy Spirit to be with us as me and Alyssa discuss and talk about your beautiful plan. And we ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. So, before we started, we were talking about Adam, how before the fall he had open communion with his maker. Mm -hmm. But after Adam and Eve fell, they lost the ability to have one-on-one -on -one communion with God. Right. And I can't imagine what that would feel like. How the depths of sorrow, right? To mm -hmm. go from being able to behold each other and have that closeness to being separated. Mm-hmm. That would... I don't know, it would almost be like the death of someone. It would That's be. That's the only thing I can equate it to. It would be. I think you're absolutely right. And it went on to talk about the fact that only Christ could bring us those two back together. He mm -hmm. was the only way, he was, like it talks about the Jacob's Ladder, he was the only one that could bridge the gulf between the Father and us again. And so mm -hmm. um, it was just, the separation part was so painful, but the hope of being reunited kept Adam going and us. It's probably the only thing that kept them alive. Without crushing their, breaking their hearts? Mm -hmm. Yeah. <laughs> And it went on to say that God explained things that would happen in the world, you know, from the flood all the way to the first coming of Christ, you know, the coming of the Messiah. And then um, Adam and Eve told this to their children and their grandchildren, and which... You know, I've always wondered about that. Are Adam and Eve considered prophets? Well, I mean, he was given the ability to see forward, right? So he was given, God gave him the ability to see in the future. So technically, would we consider Adam a prophet at the time? Because he's telling them of things people haven't experienced or things to come. So I think that's a great point. But could you imagine now you were seeing you... Because of your decisions, you are now seeing the repercussions beyond you. He, he saw the repercussions beyond just his life. He saw for generations and generations all the way up until what would happen to Jesus. Mm -hmm. That would be, I mean, pretty, uh, pretty overwhelming of an experience for Adam, <laughs> right? <laughs> mm -hmm. But he also knows the results of what Jesus will do. So, like I said, that, that hope and the understanding of what's coming. He has to see the, the pain of it, but he knows that there's, there's light coming. Mm -hmm. So, It says that he was shown that while the sacrifice of Christ would be of sufficient value to save the whole world, many would choose a life of sin rather than of repentance and obedience. And that had to be heartbreaking as well and we still perpetually see this like this is 6,000 years ago of generations we're seeing this 6,000 years in conclusions of it you know mm -hmm. it's just incredible to see the results of what this is talking about <laughs> and God came to redeem not only man but the earth itself 
Right. Because the whole world was now tainted. It wasn't perfect anymore. Right. I mean, cursed was the ground, right? Mm -hmm. The animals now have to feel the effects and they have to die along with humanity. They have to bear under the burdens of the cruel behaviors of man. I mean, uh, I think somebody was talking about the fact that when Jesus would died on the cross, it wasn't just only his hands and his feet that bear the signs of our redemption, but the crown of thorns on his head for the taking the curse of this world also upon him. Everything needed to be brought back. Mm -hmm. So it's pretty... It's pretty much more than just what we think of just Adam and Eve's redemption. It spans beyond it. Yes. Yeah. Now it goes on to talk about the fact of the law. Now it says that on page 30 it was talking about in the very beginning, it says not one of its precepts could be abrogated or changed to meet man in his fallen condition. Obviously, that if that was possible, then this whole thing would not have needed to happen uh -huh. if the law could be changed. And it says, but the Son of God who had created man could make an atonement for him. And that's what Satan's argument was. Exactly. That the law could be changed. Mm -hmm. That it, and in fact, it would be freeing, it would be better and... And we're, the results of that is an absolute disaster. And how many times have we seen people try to change laws now and it just it's ends disaster. in disaster? Yes. Um, not to get into the, into the <laughs> times, but a lot of people think that if they are less restricted or they have less law, then we would have more of a utopian type of society. But we have seen by our own eyes, that the less of the laws, the worse society gets. Mm -hmm. And this is what was happening yeah. in Adam's time. So yeah. nothing, nothing changed, right, since even in heaven all the way to here. Nothing has changed in this whole um, lie. Mm -hmm. And even, I don't know, you think about like the Old West when there was no law. I mean... That was an incredibly violent time. It was. Everybody took, uh, everybody did what was right in their own eyes kind uh -huh. of behavior. So, and we have history books to read of how that behavior uh -huh. went. <laughs> but yeah, it said, um, you were talking about how beyond just Adam and Eve's redemption, it talked about the fact the act of Christ in dying for the salvation of man would not only make heaven accessible to men, but before all the universe, it would justify God and his son in their dealing with the rebellion of Satan. Yes. So many multi-layers. Uh-huh. Because before um, Christ died on the cross, it wasn't an even split in heaven where you know, some of the angels left and some stayed, and the ones that stayed were steadfast. A lot of them didn't know who to believe. Satan was so deceptive that there were a lot that, you know, kind of wavered back and forth. Right. So, you know, God allowed this to play out to show who was right and let them decide which way they wanted to go. I mean... We think about free will here. This was there was always been free will since the beginning, uh -huh. and the fact that the angels can't read the heart, only God can read the heart. And like you said, there was very much confusion. Mm -hmm. You know, Satan had said all of this, but it hadn't played out quite yet when it was in heaven. It played out against the Father and the Son, and the fact of making decisions there, but the act of it playing out the way it is here hadn't quite manifested like it has now. Yeah. And so um, it talks about how it wasn't until there, there, there was confusion up until a moment 
And then everybody yeah. saw its true form. Mm -hmm. because Satan hadn't shown his true colors yet. Yes. He hadn't manifested that he was a murderer from the beginning. Uh -huh. he, he knew what his intention was, but the angels didn't. Right. So that, and it, that is really profound to think how God didn't just stop it. He allowed it. Okay. This is, we'll just make everything open. That's because that's how wonderful God is. He doesn't hide. He doesn't try to uh, mask anything. He wants everything crystal clear. I heard a great sermon one time about the fact of how heaven is made of gold transparent because there's nothing hidden in heaven. God makes everything known. And so even in this moment, he's like, okay, there's choices to be made, but everybody needs to have a complete understanding. Even though it's a difficult thing to have to see, that's why it will never happen again. It went on talking about, me and you kind of touched about that, that from the first, the great controversy had been upon the law of God. Yeah. And you were kind of touching on that earlier. Uh -huh. It was the first smear campaign. Mm -hmm. And um, and I'm trying to find the right words. Originally, we weren't even supposed to be involved. It was between Satan and God. Mm -hmm. And then the angels got involved. And then... We got involved, and I heard something. I don't even remember where I heard it, but it was very kind of profound. And they said, um, hell was never intended for us. Mm -hmm. It was intended for Satan and his followers. That's right. Yeah, it was eternal destruction was not meant for God's creation. It was mm -hmm. meant for the rebellion. And so, yeah, yeah it is a, um, unfortunate that even though the world has the ability to see the sides, that they want to go along with the rebellion. And uh -huh. uh, that's, it, it talked about, and something we didn't touch on and I'll go back to, is how Adam, you know, Adam lived 930 years, which is an incredibly long time. <laughs> We're blessed to maybe have 90 years on this earth, but 930 yeah. years and uh, the fact is that he came to, he was, it talked about in this chapter how he was a little apprehensive about death. He was scared because he didn't understand that there, what happens after, you know, yeah. he just thought everybody kind of just died and that was it. And God had to help him to understand that, no, there is something beyond it. And he, sh he revealed to him what was beyond. Yeah. But the fact that me putting you to rest is an act of mercy. And Adam at first didn't understand that, but living 930 years in a sinful world, he, he came to realize this was a very merciful and loving decision, and he was grateful for it. Yeah. And I think that, you know, us living only 90 years, after 90 years, we think, merciful God, you know, <laughs> for letting us rest and not having to live in this. Yeah. Yeah. So I, I always, reading that, you don't really real, think about the fact that how Adam was um, worried about the afterlife, but he was. Mm-hmm. Uh, did you want to touch on how at the very end, at chapter 32? Yes. Do you want to start it? And um... Where do you want to start from? Let's just start with the fact that when Jesus said on the cross, it is finished in John 19.30, a shout of triumph rang through every world and through heaven itself. The great contest had been so long in progress in this world was now decided and Christ uh, I believe it said earlier that that was the moment that Satan revealed himself as a murderer, and it was seen that the very same spirit which, with which he had ruled the children of men who were under his power, he would have manifested if permitted to control the intelligence of heaven. 
So now, now heaven got to see the terrifying results of what that what if they would have accepted him, what would have been the the uh, outcome? Yeah, which is I'm sure it made them tremble. Mm-hmm. And and here it is. These are these are their loving their loving friend. These were their loving um, associates in heaven mm-hmm. that were doing this. This had to be just a trembling fact because they knew him. Yeah, these, and I mean, who knows how long that he had been there. Yes. Before this happened, it mm-hmm. could have been thousands of years or ten thousands of right? years. Yeah, we have no idea for sure. It, and so there was a struggle, mm-hmm. and it was so important. Like God said, it was so important, and we've discussed that everything had to be revealed mm-hmm. and manifested. And at the cross, it was open. This was mm-hmm. this was what the result of what he wanted all along. Yes. It was finally, they finally knew at that moment that Christ was love. Yeah, I thought it was, I, I was humbled when I read that part at the very bottom of that first little column. It says, his death had answered the question whether the father and the son had sufficient love for man to exercise self-denial and a spirit of sacrifice. Yes. I'm, in my mind, I never would have had to imagine that they had to exercise self-denial and self-sacrifice, but it was. Mm-hmm. We, we don't realize the depths of these acts. Because it would have been hard for the father to not say, you know, what do you think you're doing to my kid? Like we, we talked about before, if you have a child and you are a pet of an animal, you have an uh, animal, so we can put it as an animal too, mm-hmm. right? If you have something you love and somebody is harming it, you want to go and step in and, and rescue them. But to have that self-restraint, to not have wanted to do that with Jesus, that is that right there, that, spirit, that exercise of self-denial and self-sacrifice it, it answered for the whole universe right then. That's mm-hmm. why the cross is beyond our understanding. Yeah. Yeah. And I think it said we'll be... Uh, studying it? Studying it for all eternity. Absolutely. Well, let's... Uh, <laughs> time is right out. <laughs> yeah. and, and we, you know, me and you had talked about it, and we had a few seconds, and we're going to bring it up in the panel. I, I trust that we're going to bring this back because it yeah. was too important not to. And so I am grateful to have this time with you. And I hope that you guys enjoyed the chapter on the plan of redemption, the second part that we really liked. And until next time, we'll see you through a walk through the ages. Same prophet time, same prophet place. <laughs> <laughs> Amen.